Well done. Welcome everyone, good evening, and welcome as well as many thanks to our four forum participants tonight. And I'll just take the moment to name them. Uh, William Ivey, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. Over here. And then in order of their previous terms, Jane Alexander. John Fronmeyer, Frank, Frank Hodzel, Livingston Biddle, and a non-chairman of Harvard College graduate, New York Times op-ed writer, wit, wisdom person, Frank Rich. I also want to thank the NEA, the Institute of Politics right here, and Harvard's Office of the Arts for joining together to sponsor this event, a discussion on the question, how are creativity and the arts central to the future of American democracy? Part of the reason for this special evening is to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the NEA and simultaneously to think about the role of the arts as we enter this new century. Harvard honors the arts, Harvard practices the arts, and I can't think of a better occasion to have a forum of this kind right here. This is also the sort of evening when in addition to hearing us talk about the arts and hearing about the power of words, it seems very appropriate to experience some art itself. I'm in the fortunate position of being able to present a very great artist tonight, Jesse Norman, who has generously volunteered to be here with us and to sing. She holds an honorary doctoral degree from Harvard. We consider her very much one of us, and it's a marvelous privilege for me to be able to greet her yet again. Thank you.
I'm Bill Ivey. I'm the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. And I uh, thank you very much. I want to thank Jesse Norman for that wonderful, inspiring performance, reminding us why we are all here and why we are all in this work. And I want to thank Harvard for bringing together so many of those individuals who have served our federal presence in the arts over the years and have helped to advance the NEA and at times helped to, to keep it alive. Now, and I also want to w welcome all the students. I think it's so great that Harvard has brought on, not only the, uh, uh, those of us who work with the endowment together, but those who have, uh, have a special interest in art and arts policy. So it's good to have you all with us here. You know, despite the great accomplishments of your arts endowment, it's clear that over the last 35 years, those who care deeply about the importance of art to American society have been engaged at times in a nearly Sisyphean task of moving cultural concerns somehow from the perimeter to the center of community and family life, that task of placing art and art making at the center of public policy. You know, what Chairman Alexander said, uh, thoroughly integrating art into our lives. And I think that struggle continues today. There's a certain irony here. You know, even as the endowment's successes have never quite translated into an understanding of the role of creativity and cultural heritage in the vitality of our democratic experiment, even as the arts, in a sense, have remained on the margins, something recreational, perhaps, reported in the style or the living section of the newspaper. These very same arts and our federal investment in the arts have been the battleground for sharp ideological infighting. The paintings and performances, music and photographs that too often are collectively viewed as peripheral, as entertainment, have been at times a lightning rod attracting charged rhetoric surrounding religion, sexual identity, subversive or supposedly subversive political activity, youth violence. So art, it's marginal, secondary, it's a frill, except when it's not. Art's not yet very important. You know, it's not fully established in public policy, but we frame some of our deepest beliefs and debate some of our most pressing social concerns around art and art making. And I think there's more than the germ of a serious and potentially valuable idea here, more than the hint of an important challenge in this ironic distance between the way our society devalues art in a sense in the abstract and how important it can suddenly become when it gets under our skin. The serious and valuable idea, of course, is that political controversy about art can and should be taken as irrefutable evidence that what we're about is important. And I think the equally clear challenge is to somehow distill the energy that attaches to art when it irritates and direct that energy towards centering music, painting, and dance in community and family life. You know, can we look to history, look to history for the underpinnings of a of a newly invigorated engagement in our, in our creativity and cultural heritage. I think it's tough to look, to look to history. You know, for Washington, some of the other founding fathers, an investment in culture, you know, for example, Washington's beloved dream of a national university, such an investment could have become a triumph for America's newly created central government, but those dreams foundered on the shoals of states' rights. Arts programs of the New Deal subsumed art beneath an agenda dedicated to worker relief. And our depression era commitment to culture buckled far too easily under the weight of economic recovery and partisan political attack. In fact, Michael Strait, deputy chairman of the endowment under Nancy Hanks, argued that WPA arts programs ultimately, in his, his words, left a bitter legacy. In the 1960s, the rhetoric surrounding the creation of the NEA extolled the overarching universal value of the arts. And there's wonderful language in the legislation creating the arts endowment and the humanities endowment. While at the same time, advancing the artist 
as a unique symbol of America's democratic freedoms. In a sense, a solid argument, but in retrospect, we can see that <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy, Claiborne Pell, Sidney Yates, John Bradamus, and I must pause to say that both Claiborne Pell, former senator, John Bradamus, former member of Congress, who had everything to do with creating the endowments, are here with us tonight, Senator Pell. And In retrospect, I think we can see that those leaders seized a wonderful but perhaps unique opportunity to bring a federal arts agency to life. For as critic Michael Brenson and scholar Alan Levy and others have observed, East-West Cold War conflict served as a vivid, if unacknowledged, backdrop to the construction of a federal investment in culture. In a Cold War wrestling match, art and art making really mattered. You know, what context, short of an international cultural war, could have placed pianist Van Cliburn's victory in the Moscow Tchaikovsky competition on the front page, not the style section, the front page <laughs> of virtually every newspaper in the nation, a victory in a piano competition? It's no accident that the notion of the artist as a unique symbol of our democracy faded with the fall of the Iron Curtain. And I guess it should surprise none of us that a decade-long attack on the NEA began almost exactly as the Cold War ended. That carpet of support, art and artists as democratic symbol, as metaphor for democratic values in an international arena, that carpet wasn't jerked away, but it was quietly slipped out from beneath our feet. And we took quite a fall. So it's clear that part of our task in locating a firm foundation upon which to move forward, from which to move forward, build an expanded investment in creativity and cultural heritage. Part of our task is to try to place our argument outside of what might be called the tyranny of context. Washington states' rights, federalist debate, the New Deal's relief agenda, the artist as Cold War symbol. I think these are real challenges. We can't, in a sense, we can't even have the advantage starting out of viewing American culture as a single unified stream. History, tracking the growing complexity of diversity of America's society, complexity and diversity of our society, long ago rendered untenable the assertion that was actually formulated here on this campus, formulated by Harvard scholars like F.O. Matheson and Perry Miller and their students, that we could assemble a distinct national character out of our plural regional heritage. But if we can't possess this unified cultural stream that some European nations claim, perhaps we can at least seek a lasting metaphor. And I'll note here in passing something written by John Freumeyer in the months just after he left the endowment. He said, uh, he wrote, America may not have a culture at all, but only a great cultural process. And I think Freumeyer's observation takes us part way. I think he moves from a search for a central permanent cultural identity toward a metaphor that embraces change and process. And I would assert that we do possess a defining metaphor. You know, America has, in a sense, tilted Europe 90 degrees, laying out side by side races and nationalities, ethnicities, and ultimately artistic traditions that societies traditionally placed in a hierarchical fashion atop one another. And of course, our society has not yet fulfilled the ultimate political and social promise of this egalitarian dream. But the process of democracy has bequeathed a kind of permanent border culture in which Americans live in a perpetual state of confrontation and transfer and opportunity that define real and metaphorical boundaries. Over the past couple of decades, folklorists and anthropologists such as Richard Bauman and Roger Abrams, James Clifford, Amerigo Paredes, others, some of you may have studied these scholars, they've mapped the landscape of border life, focusing on geopolitical boundaries like the border between the US and Mexico, and on great migration such as the spread of African peoples throughout the Americas. These scholars have labeled borders as society constructed by difference, an environment of opportunity, a region of intensification of commerce and social discourse, 
Borders are contact zones that provide the constant remind reminder of our otherness. They are the crucibles in which crossing and mixing facilitate a struggle for survival and a new synthesis. Now, if we add a third sense to the geopolitical and the migration sense of border, a metaphorical or conceptual definition of border, if we see the process of making culture, of making society in a democracy as essentially a borderland activity, then I think we can begin to advance art as central to the border process of conflict and recombination. Significantly, the language of border conflict is everywhere applied in discussions of American art. In a sense, we've already adopted the notion of border as, as a metaphor for art making. And these are just drawn, these examples are drawn from just recent newspaper uh, writings. Peter Watrous reviewing the new uh, Keith Jarrett uh, piano CD. The piano in jazz has always been the meeting ground between European and American musical practice. Bernard Hall, in writing of Mark Blitzstein's opera Regina, the Broadway show, a cultural collision of East European Jewry and the descendants of African slaves, is fresh food packed with energy, just waiting for more upscale tastes. That's an interesting definition. Paul Simon, the singer-songwriter Paul Simon, writing about music and culture, music is sometimes the only benign avenue of communication between antagonists. Meeting place, cultural collision, benign avenue. These border words could easily be drawn from scholars like Clifford and Abrams and Paredes. So the border, our nation's perpetual border lifestyle, which can be simultaneously seen as the central burden and the principal opportunity of our democracy, this same central metaphor is employed almost reflexively to characterize the unique vitality of America's art and art making. America's cultural heritage and creativity. And the metaphor can be extended, or I guess compressed, to encompass the collision of artistic traditions. You know, borderland collisions facilitated by technologies, old and new, those collisions that force borrowing and accommodation and give us jazz, film, modern dance, and musical theater. Borders, geopolitical, cultural, and metaphorical. To me, an extraordinarily useful way of looking at our society and a useful way to place art at the center of the American experience, safe perhaps from the tyranny of context. If border as metaphor for civil society and art as the currency of border exchange together offer us a firm starting point for asserting the importance of a federal role, they work together. How do we proceed? How do we convert thought into action as we build on the past, begin this century, and move forward from this endowment anniversary. We must first, of course, ensure that the unique alliance that supports the NEA, artists and educators, arts organization boards, civic and political leaders, universities, entertainment executives, we must ensure that this support structure remains strong and united. We must also pay special attention to those components of civil society in which art and public policy can make a real difference. I can think of three, and there are many more, but I'll mention three here. First, in education, the centrality of art to civil society, the importance of art to the establishment of a new high-tech literacy, and the value of art as a vehicle for enhancing the brain skills of young people. In education, insights and evidence can be marshaled to place art in its appropriate central position in our educational system, that's one. Second, we must address the needs of artists as a unique class of workers and citizens, a unique class of workers and citizens, by first conducting research on the career paths of artists, by asserting the central role of artists as ambassadors of the border, bringing heritage and creativity to truly livable, truly livable communities. Finally, or third, we must place art and art making at the heart of America's diplomacy, a wonderful opportunity. Joseph Nye has identified soft power in international relations, the ability to, quote, get what we want through attraction rather than coercion. Art is the soft power of our diverse society. 
it can be a centerpiece of our international diplomatic agenda. These tasks are not going to be easy. If art is going to be this important, this central to education, community, and diplomacy, and in other sectors, we must engage other actors and other agendas. We must continue to move beyond the era of entitlement in which the arts simply assumed a moral claim on the public wallet toward an era of community service in which that support is truly earned. But I believe this is the right time to move ahead, to build upon the work that so many have completed in the past 35 years. A vision less dependent on context and a program grounded in evidence and research will flourish in a strong economy. They'll flourish together in a strong economy, a strong society, a society that rallies wealth and technology to enable art and artists to resolve, perhaps for the first time, the borderland collision of cultures that is both the burden and the blessing of our democracy. Thank you. And it's now, It's now, my, it's now my great pleasure to say a word or two about our, the moderator of tonight's discussion, Frank Rich, a graduate of Harvard College. Mr. Rich joined the New York Times in 18, 1980 and was, <laughs> 1980, and was, and was for, and for 14 years served as chief drama critic. He currently is the journal columnist for the Times op-ed page. Last year, he also became senior writer for the New York Times Magazine the first time in the newspaper's history that anyone has held these dual titles, these dual roles. So Frank, if you would join me on stage, and if the other chairman would come forward, we'll begin our conversation. Good evening. It's uh, great to be back at Harvard and uh, very gratifying to see that uh, this crowd uh, will turn out on a night when Billy Crystal is at the Hasty Pudding. <laughs> I saw these TV cameras and so on this afternoon in Cambridge I and I thought, oh, it's, it's for this. There, there must be a Mablethorpe exhibition uh, tied in with a. <laughs> hey, we're not going to refight uh, the culture wars of uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s tonight. Just a few words about the format. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists very briefly. They're full uh, and very interesting bios in your program. I'm going to have an opening question for, for all of them except Mr. Ivey because he's already uh, spoken to the point. Um, then we're going to mix it up for a while and eventually uh, take questions from you. So first, in actual chronological order, Livingston Biddle was working as a special assistant to Claiborne Pell and was intimately involved in drafting the legislation that not only produced the NEA but also the National Endowment for the Humanities. He worked with the two legendary uh, first uh, chairs of the NEA, Roger Stevens and uh, Nancy Hanks, and then became chairman himself, appointed by Jimmy Carter. He has, among other things, in his uh, illustrious career, written four novels as well as a memoir about his life in the arts uh, racket. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Hodsell is an attorney and a longtime public servant. He was appointed as the endowment's fourth chairman by President Reagan in 1981. He served through both terms of the Reagan administration for eight years. He is now residing in Colorado, where he is the CEO of his own consulting firm. And he's also co-chair of the American Assembly on the Arts and the Public Purpose. John Fronmeyer is an attorney, ethicist, and writer. 
He was named the NEA's fifth chairman by George Bush, the senior, I guess we have to say now, in 1989, and served through uh, 1992. He wrote a very entertaining book about uh, this trial by fire called Leaving Town Alive, Confessions of an Arts Warrior. It was published in 1993. I recommend it. Uh, he has taught courses at over 80 colleges, examining the intersection of arts, of art, politics, ethics, and religion in American life. And he now practices trial law in Bozeman, Montana. Jane Alexander is the chair of the NEA, whose hair was literally turned white by encounters with the Gingrich Congress. <laughs> I think I saw you do St. Joan at Arena Stage years ago, but, but the real St. Joan performance was under very difficult uh, circumstances uh, in Washington in the 90s. Of course, she was appointed to the chair's job by uh, Bill Clinton. She served from 1993 through 1997. I don't think I have to describe her great career in every performing medium, the stage, movies, uh, the theater, excuse me, television. She's won a, the top awards in all of them. Um, and she has now resumed her acting career uh, for, I think, better pay than, than you could get uh, from the federal government. Um, and I think, Bill, you, you've been, have you been properly introduced or? I've introduced myself. Yeah, so. They, I, they may know enough. Um, I want to, I want to, um, really ask a first question that's entirely off of your talk, just to sort of get, get things going here. And, and that is to look at the, the uh, what is the future of a federal role in the arts? How do, how do we see it rolling out in the future? Not the past, not even what is in Washington under uh, bills of guidance right now, but Taking, taking the long view. I'm particularly interested, too, in how any of you see that role changing. Bill mentioned in his talk three areas that, that are, might be concentrated on in, in an agenda that, that, the, that the federal presence would care particularly about arts and education, uh, also about the needs of the artist community, and also, intriguingly, about making culture in some way part of the heart of American diplomacy. Um, what do you see the future? Should we start with Jane? Can I start with you? Uh, uh, I think that the fu future of a federal role um, is, is not necessarily sure, because we need to know who the politicians are who are going to be in Congress. That's first and foremost. I would certainly desire a federal role. Uh, I think that the nation needs it. I think that uh, even though most of the funding for the arts in America is from the private sector, it's very important to have that small percentage of public sector and particularly federal, now national role, because it, it invites artists to be part of society and it celebrates our own genius and, um, in, in our society. So I've always promoted that. It also creates opportunity and access for all. I do not think it's a sure thing, though, because of the tension that inevitably exists between politics and art, as Garrison Keillor so aptly says all the time. And, and that's what is of concern to me. Well, part of the legislation that was written by Senator Powell and uh, Libby Biddle and others says that the United States ought not just to be a leader in military and economic means, but in the realm of ideas and of the spirit. Uh, I believe that uh, with every fiber of my being. But if you look at the way in the United States has funded the arts over the time that they have been in existence by the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, they occupy a very low seat uh, in our realm of priorities indeed. I would hope that that would change, but I think it's going to take a sea change in the kind of thinking uh, that goes on in Congress in terms of what's important uh, in a federal government. Uh, in my view, it isn't just to put an impregnable row of missiles around us, but rather to help us as human beings to fully fulfill that which we are. 
Um, I think the government has a very real role in that. Um, but I cannot give you a roadmap of how we get there. Well, I'd, I'd like to just start by tipping my hat to the two chairmen who are not here, Roger Stevens, who started it all, and Nancy Hanks, mm -hmm. who skillfully built the coalition mm -hmm. that allowed the endowment to grow. On the Looking at the present and then future real quick, the bad side is that the National Endowment for the Arts was attacked the way it was, uh, and there's no question about that. But you know, the good side is that it survived through all of that. Uh, it survived through all of that with lots of congressmen and lots of senators of both parties banding together, notwithstanding very difficult situation politically, uh, to keep it alive. And even though the budget went down, it did survive. My own view is that no matter who the Congress is or who the President is, at least in the foreseeable future, the endowment uh, will be there as a, as, a, as, a, as a political matter for the future. Bill Ivey has talked about providing, the NEA providing a sense of permanence. Uh, uh, this is broader than the three things you mentioned tonight, but in some of your other, in some of your other uh, uh, speeches. Centrality, continuity, and strategic investment. At lunch today, Libby Biddle talked about the arts endowment is important because the arts are important. I'd like to merge those and say that the endowment, I think, needs to continue to be, as it has been, a symbol of national caring. And then I draw on what, what Bill said, and at its best, a, 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 an avenue and a vehicle for strategic investment. And the bully pulpit, which is the caring, um, I think there really has to be more attention paid in the future for those outside the arts community, that is, people outside this room in large part, uh, to explain why the arts, all of them, are and should be part of everyone's lives and intellect. I think both of those are important. I think it's also important, and here I differ with what Jack Javits, and I suspect Claiborne Pell, but I have a quote from, from Javits on this, uh, at the beginning talked about. The, the, and, and this came out of the Center for Arts and Public Policy. G. Bradford is here, that they basically talked about we need a bulwark against the popular culture in Hollywood, which, which dominates uh, everything. I would suggest that it's more useful to think of the arts as including all of that. Robert Pinsky helped us, and I won't quote it, I was going to quote it, uh, writing in our American Assembly report how the arts are everything. You know, they're, they're, they're the popular culture, they're the, the, the culture that's in museums and opera houses, and, and they're also the things that happen in communities. Uh, I don't think it will help to have us consider the arts as in the Italian Renaissance. There was a group in the theater called the Commedia Erudita who basically took the Greek plays and said, we're going to do it exactly that way. So I think we have to think of all of that. Uh, incidentally, Ellen Lovell is also here tonight in Creative America, done by the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. Some of those same points were made. Strategic investment. That's really hard in any organization. Just talk to corporations about it. Certainly hard in, in, in a political uh, organization. I might just say that this booklet, which the NEA put out, I guess must have been under you, Jane, of, of accomplishments from 1965 to 1995, contains a number of strategic uh, investments. What, what in the 21st century are likely to be strategic? And I'm going to be quick here. I'm going to just suggest five things, which are very different, perhaps, than perhaps have been in the, in the dialogue, uh, or at least maybe they are different. First, I think it's really important to encourage mainstream and niche venues to showcase good work not likely to be hits and not likely to be at what I would call aficionado standards. What do I mean by that? I mean Durer pit drawings in a permanent collection of a museum as opposed to the latest Impressionist show. I mean movies like Cider House Rules, which never made it to Montrose, Colorado, which is the closest place 50 miles from where I live where there's a movie theater. Um, secondly, I think that it's important to ensure that the new technologies, and I'm thinking particularly of broadband, either through cable or digital, digital lines, remain open in a technologically equivalent way. That's really important to fare not produced by the media owners. Thirdly, I think it's important to reduce the market rates of return on the public goods in cultural properties the same way that there are lots of coalitions on the environment to save rainforests in Brazil and the like, and Albert Arthur is involved in some of that. Fourthly, and Jane may not like this, I think it's really important to encourage 
the right mix. I've never forgotten something she said at the American Assembly, and I'll just stop on this one with that. Where is Ed Sullivan when we need him? Lenny Bernstein and Mark Winton Marcellus today mix these things. And finally, I agree with Bill 100%. Arts education in schools is, 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 is critical. Process, the arts endowment needs to pitch in the context of the times. And uh, people in any government agency, so that's more my experience, uh, need to think of what their elected masters need. Finally, I'd like to say, since I'm a Republican on all of this, that the NEA is really, the Arts Endowment, excuse me, Anna Steele, is really not a partisan issue. Both Republicans and Democrats share its support. Only a very few want it abolished. But the real need politically is to broaden the groups that care. Thank you, Frank. I just want to uh, second what has been said here and also to say what an absolute delight it is for me to be here with my wonderful mentor in Washington and defender of the arts, the most enlightened among enlightened senators, Claiborne Pell, and John Bradamus, who had given such valiant support to the arts in the House at the very beginning and all the time thereafter. And Nuela Pell is here, and my own dear wife, Katharina, who is an artist. So it's a delightful evening, and Len Garman. And Jesse, it was such a wonderful joy to hear your <laughs> voice. And that leads me to come back to what has been said about the priorities, the position of the arts in our society. I think when we hear a voice like Jessie Norman's with her wonderful interpretation, we have to think of the best in the arts. And the best in the arts abides with us beyond wars, beyond political changes, beyond changes in government. The best in the arts abides. I remember when I was working for Senator Pell, I did a speech for him, which he liked. And it began, what do we think of when we think of ancient Egypt? Do we remember the long lines of Ptolemies and pharaohs or the architectural triumph of the pyramids? As you can see, Mr. Pell was a f fan of alliteration. <laughs> what do we think of when we think of ancient Greece? Do we think of all the wars between Athens and Sparta, or do we think of the Acropolis and the Parthenon? And really, if you trace through history, you will see that the arts leave a legacy which is abiding and strong and lasts through history. And that is the kind of legacy, I believe, that we are all looking for as a result of the National Endowment for the Arts. I think of the arts as essential to our civilization and to our country. And I can't think, of, I'm, I know I'm somewhat biased in this, but I can't think of anything of greater importance than creative expression brought forward through the excellence of the arts. And if you take that as an essential, the other part of the, of the equation, the corollary to that, in my view, is the National Endowment. Look at the history of that. Look at the beginnings, when the arts were looked upon as frivolous, as problematic, as possibly creating pornography as even unconstitutional. There was an attack on that basis in terms of a federal program. Others said the arts are not that way at all. But when we come down to what is the abiding value, that is so, so very important. And 
I think that has been in the back of the endowment's purpose all, all along, to create something abiding. So here you have a program that in 15 years saw the doubling of symphony orchestras, the tripling of opera companies, the 10 times growth of resident theaters, the 15 times growth of, of dance companies, and the 25 times over growth of private giving. All those suggest to me and affirm to me and confirm to me that the arts are just with a fundamental catalyst, which is called the National Endowment. Um, I want to pick up that point a bit because I think we all we all agree that, that the NEA has played this this marvelous role in in it, first of all just the measurable increase of arts institutions that live with sighting. But it's it's it seems to me it's it's very easy for us to talk about how valuable the arts are, how wonderful culture is, particularly when we're preaching to the converted, you know, where we are we are at Harvard after all. Um, the, the, but the way it's played out in real life at the NEA is, or, or indeed throughout the history of uh, federal arts funding, and Bill was talking about uh, some of this in his talk, is, is that the case for funding often has had to involve utilitarian arguments. In the Depression, the WPA put people back to work. Um, as Bill was saying, during the Cold War, uh, Van Cliburn, uh, theater artists who went to Russia, they were our ambassadors of the democratic way of life. Under uh, Jane, uh, the arguments had to be made when the, when the knife was really at the NEA's throat that there was a utilitarian purpose in terms of building tourism, uh, uh, cre again creating jobs to some extent, um, raising SAT scores, uh, uh, but none of but and and growing uh, excuse me growing the redevelopments of uh, down, down, desolate downtowns uh, throughout America. How do we make the case to future hostile congresses to the American people who are not caught up in high culture? Um, how do we make the case for this affection for culture that we all have, but clearly has not penetrated the entire country. And I think, Frank, that uh, what you've said is, is very, very well put. And I have used myself the same arguments that you have used, the practicality and the tangible values of the arts in so many ways. Often, a given congressman or senator will listen to that kind of argument more than he will the value of, a, of an artistic accomplishment that doesn't have that kind of practicality. But I look upon this program as growing and increasing, and I'm sure that that will happen. And yet, provided that those individuals who run it and are involved with it and live it and those few members of Congress who are the real leaders, like Senator Pell and John Bradman, those few members take a leadership role and they speak not just about practicalities, but from their hearts. And they, uh, uh, Sidney Yates is a good example of that, and the master of appropriations in the House for so many years and a great defender of the arts, he speaks when he speaks about the arts from his heart. And people listen. And, I and think that's the leadership. Pe people that is listen, and yet the, the appropriations for the NEA are down. I mean, how, is there a better way to make the case? Give them a chance. Yeah. Actually, we have a theory on this out in Montana, and that is that, that if uh, an infinite number of rednecks and an infinite number of pickups with an infinite number of shotguns, shoot at an infinite number of road signs, we can recreate all the famous works of literature in Braille. 
that sounds, sounds like a good grant application. Uh, <laughs> actually, there, 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 there is a point to that. And, and, <laughs> and that is, it's, it's a point that Len Garment made back in the, in the early days of this, uh, of this controversy, and that is that a person who has not been seriously affected by great literature is not likely to be seriously affected when that great literature is the subject of book burning. I think one of the points that we really have missed, uh, not missed, but, but it just hasn't come to the surface with enough precision, is that the arts and humanities are essential to maintaining a democratic form of government. Because the humanities and the arts are the core of a democratic government. And if we cannot transmit that message, then we're missing a lot more than just the support of the arts. I, I agree completely with John, but you know, uh, I guess rising as the former director of the Country Music Hall of Fame to the, uh, <laughs> to the, to the, uh, to the disparagement of, uh, of folks who run around in pickup trucks uh, and, and, and listen I, to music. I have a pickup truck. I, 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 uh, I have a uh, pickup truck, too. I, I think that one of, the, one of the challenges that we face is our sense of what constitutes art, what constitutes humanity in this society, is too often uh, artificially narrowed. It, our sense of literature and what is of quality in literature has to be broader than what we would find in a great books course. Our sense of what is fine in music has to be more than, that, than what has been conveyed to us, the very important work that has been conveyed to us from the great classical traditions of Europe. We have to find a way to engage the real culture that we live in as we live it, identifying quality and dross everywhere, but not to not get involved in the kind of uh, categorical separations that, that take the blues or country music or take uh, everything on television, everything produced by a commercial film studio, and somehow put it in a category of the, of the enemy, something that we have to fight against. I think, if, I think if that's the way we define the federal role, then I think we are doomed to playing a minority position in which we're fighting these perceptions and not fully engaged. Because I think there are ways to, to engage the popular culture. I think it must be engaged now because with mergers and acquisitions, with the fact that our cultural heritage is owned by companies that mostly have well, headquarters. You know, I think it's, a time, it's time to engage it. But I, I, I don't think the uh, setting up of arbitrary categories of good art and bad art will work for us in this society. We've been handed a democratic horizontal structure. I think we have to find a way to work it, not fight it. But, oh, go ahead, Jane. Yeah, I, I, I just want to, uh, 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 the, the endowment's been a populist organization for a very long time, since Nancy Hanks. I mean, uh, I don't see that, that that's what, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. That we've been defining high art or l low art. I've never seen the endowment like that. Um, you really think that's well? I, if you look at what the endowment funds, it works almost entirely through the not-for-profit arts. Hasn't found effective ways of engaging the for-profit entertainment community, except in jazz and a few areas that have been, and, and, and small presses and so on. And there are there are categories of artistic work. That are uh, that are that have not been addressed at, at all by the endowment. Now, I think that there are limited resources, so choices must be made. But one of the things that I think we have to move away from is a sense of art being only art with a capital A. It's so uh, it's so frequent to encounter a citizen. You know, I, there's a Walmart that I drive to when I'm going. I, I shop in when I'm driving out to visit my antique airplane at the airport where it lives near Washington. And, and frequently, when I'm walking the aisles of that Walmart, I, I will say, what is my message to the citizens in this Walmart as the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts? How, do, how does my work engage the lives of these citizens the way Rodney Slater, Secretary Slater of the Department of Transportation, engages their lives? And I think we do. I think art does engage people every single day, but I think we're a little distance from finding the language and the concepts that let our federal agency engage at that point. Well, let me take the opposite of that, because I, 
I, I think this is a real dilemma that we haven't ever really worked our way through. My understanding of the endowment is that it is a counter market strategy, that it's there to help promote that which the market is not going to sustain. And, yeah. and, and so we do have a real dilemma here, because we want to be part of the market in the sense we want to succeed. We want that art to be available widely. We want it to be appreciated. On the other hand, you know, we're there to support it because the market doesn't support it. There's well, a lot of art that we just let fail. No, but there's a lot. Wait a minute. I come Lots from a the theater background, and uh, Jesse comes from an opera background. Both of us have performed in venues that were supported by the NEA. Yeah. And my whole career began with the Great White Hope Grant to Arena Stage, which was supported by the NEA. The Great White Hope Grant, $25,000, went on to become a hit Broadway play, went on to become a hit movie made the careers of James Earl and myself. So we do engage in that way. We nurture at the right moment, and then we bring up, and your career, I'm sure, had a lot. Yeah. So I, I don't see it quite the but, same way that but, either of you do. Well, I'm, I'm with Bill on this, but I, I want to I come, come, come back, because I think that to relate to people when you're talking about public dollars, that doesn't mean that you're going to invest in a movie studio or, or a television show. But it does mean that what you do in the not-for-profit sector is joined at the hip in many cases, not in all cases, with what people know of around the country as art. So I, I, I think the broad definition of art is extremely important. That, that's separate from what you actually fund at the endowment. But you need to think of what the broad definition is. I want to come back to Frank's, Frank Rich's uh, question as, you know, how do you convince a Congress about uh, why they should fund the arts and so on. And my view is you convince a Congress or a president or you know any, any elected officials about that in the same way that you convince them that transportation is important or you need a highway system or you need health care or anything else. You're going to have a small group in the political sphere that are going to be sort of uh, on your side, so to speak, genuinely on your side. They won't take that much convincing. They'll need some convincing. But for the majority of folks, and this is true of almost anything, perhaps, uh, you're going to have to convince them the old-fashioned way, uh, which will include all sorts of things, from people in their communities coming forward and say, I want this one, John or Jack or whoever it is, and, and you damn well better vote for it. It isn't that much money anyway. Or in the community, uh, you, you, you convince them by showing that in, your, in, their, in their district okay, or in their state, that there are lots of good folks who are voters uh, who uh, uh, want these things to happen. That's the way it's done in every program that I'm aware of in the federal government. And that's the kind of grassroots thing. I must say that Bob Lynch, who's here from the Americans for the Arts, has been really super uh, at putting together. We need to keep, I think, working on that. Um, let me, I would, Frank, yeah. if I might uh, recount with a bit of levity here. OK. Uh, an old-fashioned way of getting support for the arts. Blackmail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> al almost, <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> Roger Stevens, the first chairman, put me in charge of his congressional liaison when I was his deputy chairman. And there was one member of Congress, I won't name who it was, was very much opposed to this new fledgling program and Roger asked me to see what I could do to ameliorate the situation. So I went up on the hill, and I took with me an old friend who was by then an old friend, Gregory Peck, who was a new member of the National Council on the Arts. And I called the congressman's office, and I said, I'm Livingston Biddle. And I'm here to see Congressman X. And the boy said, "Who? what was your name? Uh, what do you represent? Uh, and I said, the National Endowment for the Arts. And the boy said, uh, the arts? Oh, uh, Mr. Fiddle, uh, <laughs> you know, the congressman is tied up this afternoon. And uh, for the next week, and why don't you call back two weeks from now, and maybe, maybe he will see you. 
And I knew that was too late. So I said, oh, I'm so sorry. You see, I'm here with my old friend Gregory Peck today, and we were hoping that the congressman would have a few minutes to see us. And the boy said, you mean Gregory Peck, the movie star? And I said, is there another one? <laughs> and so the boy said, uh, just a minute. And the next words I heard was, uh, Mr. Fiddle, uh, <laughs> the congressman will be delighted to see uh, Mr. Peck, and it just so happens that we have a cancellation. <laughs> and he come any time. So we walked to the, through the august halls of the House of Representatives, and uh, Gregory Peck is a towering figure, as you all know. And he had just been playing Abe Lincoln. So he had. Uh, <laughs> That's the secret. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a. A little extra aura about him. And the whole staff of this congressional office was out in the hall waiting. Here he comes, here he comes, here comes Mr. Lincoln. And the congressman came out and he said, Oh, Mr. Peck, I'm so happy you drop by today. And I just happened to have here a, a little brochure of the House of Representatives. I wonder if you would autograph this for, for my uh, wife and children. And Gregory took it in his hand and he said, uh, well, certainly uh, nice to see you, Congressman. And uh, do you know my friend Livingston Biddle over here? <laughs> So the congressman looks sideways and says, uh, no, I don't think I do know him. Uh, who is he? And uh, Gregory said, well, he's the new deputy chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. And that's actually why we are here. We are here to see you about your opinion of the Endowment for the Arts, and we're here to get your support. The congressman draws back. Oh, Mr. Peck, I'm so sorry. I didn't understand that at all. And uh, this young man, I'm sure, is a very nice fellow. But you see, I'm just not very happy with this program. And however, Mr. Peck, let me tell you, I will give it my very best consideration. And Gregory looked at him and said, in that case, Mr. Congressman, in his deep voice, I will give this autograph my very best <laughs> consideration. Here, here. And well, Congressman I, burst into laughter. And he said, all right, I've been had. But I've been had by a pro. And I always appreciate that. So sure, I'll support your program. Now give me the autograph. <laughs> I'm, I, plus a change, I might say that another towering f uh, figure in the movie was Melanie Griffith, was used to similar effect uh, in the 1990s. Um, uh, she had not played Abe Lincoln. No. Um, <laughs> uh, this whole issue, we were talking uh, a little bit before about this whole issue of embracing high culture and pop culture together, that, um, that American culture, as I think we all know, is a vaudeville. It is the Ed Sullivan show. It, it does. It, go from Leonard Bernstein to Elvis Presley to Charlie Chaplin to Jack Benny, whatever. But an issue that is raised in terms of the endowment and the mixing of these things uh, that's, much, that's much more crucial now than it ever has been in the past is indeed the size of these entertainment companies that control the rights to pop culture and to their power. And increasingly, we've seen more and more of alliances between public and private with, one could say, questionable at least results. For instance, in the whole sensation show controversy at the uh, Brooklyn Museum, the interesting part of the controversy was not about Chris Ophelia's paintings, but it was about the fact that Charles Saatchi, uh, a collector and a businessman, um, seemed to play, uh, at least according to some reporting done in the New York Times, uh, a role where he uh, uh, usurped or tried to usurp some of the artistic prerogatives of the Brooklyn Museum 
a public institution. The Kennedy Center for the Arts uh, is largely known to Americans now for a very cheesy television special, not at Ed Sullivan quality that it puts on every year uh, as an award show. Um, various not-for-profit theaters, uh, resident theaters around the country have been in, have invited uh, Disney in. The now defunct Live End Corporation sponsored a production at uh, Lincoln Center in New York with somewhat disastrous fiscal uh, results. Where is this going to lead? And it's the argument, invite the private sector in so that the government doesn't have to foot the bill. But when you invite the private sector in, uh, you can contaminate conceivably or not, I'm curious in your opinions, uh, these, these public institutions that do receive yeah. taxpayers' money. I, 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 a foolish consistency being the hobgob of, of little minds, I will, I will now proceed to uh, contradict myself because I, <laughs> I, do, I do feel that while it's very important to have a working definition of art that's sufficiently broad to encompass everything that Americans do, I, I, I think we're in, a, in an era in, in which there's an unprecedented need for an investment in mission-driven arts organizations. The reason I say that is that, that there, there are two things that are happening simultaneously that I think are, 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 are very troubling. One is that we live at a time in which there's unprecedented confidence in the ability of the marketplace to solve any problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we know from experience that the marketplace cannot solve every problem. Second, as Frank points out, there have been these mergers and acquisitions of such a scale that the kinds of decisions that could be made in a corporate environment 25 or 30 years ago are not possible. When I joined the staff of the Country Music Foundation in 1971, Goddard Lieberson was the president of Columbia Records. Now, Goddard Lieberson had been president for a decade. He would be president for another decade. And he believed that a, a record label, which was uh, owned by, it was part of C the CBS family, but it was owned here, that a record label should have a classical division. And it, it didn't exist only because it could pay its own way quarter by quarter. It was there because it was an important part of Columbia Records. And the Columbia heritage was that they were a cultural organization, though a for-profit company. Then it became CBS Records. Goddard was gone. Now it's Sony Music. It becomes much tougher. We don't have orchestras with contracts with American companies today. We don't have, there are many reasons for it. But one of the reasons is that everything is driven by bottom line concerns that have to be implemented over the short run, not the long run. And I think it means that the not-for-profit organization that by law has to be mission driven. It has to put community service, public service, its mission first. I think those kind of entities become more and more and more important as a counterbalance, not necessarily to entertainment per se, but to a kind of corporate mentality that I think can be very problematic and that holds great sway today. Uh, if, if the economy drops off a bit, I think it may not hold so much sway, but, but clearly I think there's a real need there. But if they're ambitious institutions with, with big, big programming ideas, uh, how do they support themselves without letting in these corporations for whatever altruistic reason? Well, I'm, I'm calling for more public investment, I guess. I mean, I, I think that that partnerships are great. The experience I had in Nashville with that organization worked very, very successfully with the for-profit music industry in that community. Uh, but I see that that's very difficult to replicate in some other environments. And, uh, as, and, and so I think we need to form the good partnerships that work. But clearly, there are examples that show that the mission of a not-for-profit can be subsumed easily under the power of, uh, or buried under the power. It seems to happen almost every time. Every museum, it seems, that gets in bed with a corporation, including some of the really elite institutions, because uh, one can't just pick on the Brooklyn Museum. There have been plenty of others, uh, including the Smithsonian, to take an example, which you know sent a, a, a show around the country that seemed as much an ad for the Discover card as it was uh, an exhibit of uh, Smithsonian wares. So what do we? It's okay. a the question is who takes the risks? Um, and, yeah. and if we know that corporate America is bottom line driven, then who's left to take the risks other than the government which the people own? 
I mean, I think in a democracy when, I, I know it doesn't work this way, folks, but. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the Kennedy school. <laughs> but, but in a democracy where the people own the government, shouldn't that percentage of the people that want to see their government take risks be represented? Yeah. Uh, be represented in what the arts do. What we have done at the Arts Endowment is 99.9% .9 safe. And I think we have not fulfilled the mission that we should have done. Well, to take that, let's take that a step further. It seems that in the NEA controversies, it, the, the subtext is always the same. When, the, when, when, when war breaks out in Washington, a feeling that uh, people in the arts community and, and, and liberals in general feel that the NEA should take any risk, it, 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 artistic risk, uh, bound by the First Amendment, exploit the First Amendment to the fullest. Conservatives take the point of view, inevitably, some of that art is going to offend some constituents, and that's not the, a federal role. That's not a role of taxpayers' dollars. Are we going to get beyond that paradigm? If we don't get beyond that argument and paradigm, funding can never be secure, it seems to me, or go up. You know, we, we struggled with that so much. I mean, uh, Jane struggled with that, Bill struggled with that. I mean, Frank and Livy were, lived in, in calmer times, but they struggled with it as well. And one of the things that we explored was, well, could there be an adjacent foundation that's funded with private money, and could this do the, the, the tough stuff, and, and you know, you have the other one here that does all of the easy stuff. Uh, you know, I don't think that works. I really don't. I, I think that the government needs to step up to this issue. And if, in fact, the, host the endowment is hostage to whoever in Congress wants to complain about whatever grant, whether, they actually, whether the endowment actually gave it or not, then the endowment, I think, is always going to be a marginal agency. Well, and what you've all worked... I think that, uh, that uh, while John speaks eloquently about the moment today when, when things uh, are risky, and risk-taking is more pronounced than it was in my time. But I think of Roger Stevens, who was the first chairman, and I think his greatest contribution to the endowment was to advocate, and strongly advocate, and with a, Roger's strength of personality, advocate the supporting of off-off-Broadway theater, which was very controversial in that time, and which uh, could have scuttled the whole program. But he was so convinced that this was the proper course to take that he took it. And uh, I think that's God bless Roger for that risk-taking in a difficult time when the endowment was a fledgling organization. But, but some of the backing up of this risk has to happen at the top. And while much as we admire and celebrate the Claiborne Pells and John Bradamuses and Sidney Yates's, um, look at this current presidential campaign. Has any candidate in either party, or for that matter, Alan Keyes, mentioned, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mentioned anything about culture or the arts? Has anyone? No. Okay. Although um, Al Gore did give a speech last week in New York about the arts. Without mentioning them? <laughs> <laughs> he mentioned them. It was off the record. It was off the record. No, it was at the <laughs> Municipal <laughs> Arts Society. You know, I don't know about a major speech. I mean, there, there are positions, certainly on the Republican side. George W. is in favor of the arts endowment. Uh, he doesn't want to fund uh, obscenity. And since obscenity is narrowly defined, that's not a, right. not a huge exception. Um, George, John McCain doesn't want to uh, uh, f have a national presence in the arts, nor does Alan Keyes. And I would assume the, yeah. some of the other candidates who dropped out were on the same side. But, I, but I'd like to, 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 to come back to this issue of safe versus unsafe and, 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 and what's possible. There are 99% of what's unsafe, including 99% of what's on off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway or off-off-loop in Chicago or wherever you want to say, um, is not going to cause the political system a problem. It is not the formality of art that causes the political system a problem, though there'll be brouhaha's here and there on you know this or that sculpture in a public place. What causes the political system a problem is something that is deeply offensive to a, even if it's a small group, but a significant group of people. 
Um, and, you know, things like not all of Maplethorpe, incidentally, but Maplethorpe XYZ was significantly offensive to a significant group of people. Um, and, and, and that was true of a, of a number of other things that the endowment has, you know, has funded and other people have funded, though it's a tiny, tiny percentage. So what does that mean if you're in charge of a government agency? I mean, there are problems in science, I might add, at the National Science Foundation at the Institutes of Health that are not like what happens at the arts, but they have similar repercussions. It means that the people in charge of that agency have to be thinking about where the governance is. And I'm not talking First Amendment now, I'm talking politics. Um, and basically the governance is in the elected officials. And that means the Congress and the President and the Vice President, those are the elected officials. And that's why I said when I was talking in the beginning that there is an enormous need, I don't care what agency of government you're, you're working with, to be thinking about what those elected officials, I'm sure that President Rudenstein has to think about his board of overseers at Harvard periodically, though probably not that much, uh, <laughs> or what, what, what they have not. to think about. We are all subject to these things. So coming back to the, to the, to the issue of safe and unsafe, when, when I was at the endowment, the first day I arrived at the endowment, everybody thought I was going to burn the place down, tear down the paintings, uh, destroy culture, and that, 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 whatever paintings <laughs> uh, uh, that, that might be around. But, but, but basically what, 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 what I said to my staff when I first came in, I said, look, guys, I'm the political guy here. I want the panels to do everything by art, but if you've got something that's going to cause a political problem, you owe it to me to tell me about it. And that wasn't perfect, but it, but it mostly was worked, okay? And then I'll make the judgment, take the heat, if, if I think that something is really going to cause a problem out there. And there were several grants that I missed, and several grants were where we had our speeches between the arts community and me, which would make me overly popular in the arts community. But, but the endowment sailed through most of that. And, and I, I would suggest that that's true of any human institution. You have to think about the people who ultimately, and you can only push it so far. But Frank, you passed on those problematical grants to John. <laughs> I, 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 I did. I, I did. But the Michael Thorpe and Serrano but, ones were rent right. They, they were. They were. They were done by me. But but all right. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me t let me tell you how that worked. Okay. No, let me tell you how it worked. <laughs> no, you you had to deal with them. And had I been at the endowment on the Maplethorpe grant, which, which was the original application, my museum director came up and said, we've got a Maplethorpe, you know, a request for a, a Maplethorpe uh, exhibit. And I said, well, it all depends. Uh, what kind of a Maplethorpe exhibit? And it was going to be the same as at the Whitney uh, exhibit, which means uh, essentially uh, his uh, uh, portraiture and flowers and things of that nature. Uh, there was a couple of nude family scenes, but there was none of the XYZ series in it. And I said, that's fine. We can defend that. Uh, XYZ series was added later. Now, had I been at the endowments, it's easier to say, uh, I would have had a, a back and forth with Janet Carden and told her in advance. That I, was, I did this in some other areas and basically said, we're going to have to withdraw the money uh, and you can use money for other purposes, but this is going to destroy the endowment. And I would have done that, okay, on day one. I wasn't there, so I can't prove it to you that I would have done it. <laughs> Uh, the Serrano grant was to the uh, North Carolina School of the Arts. We didn't know that Serrano was going to be, you know, and, and Piss Christ was going to be particularly, but was, was going to be a part of that uh, because they picked the artists, and it so happened that that came up. But I will say flat out, and this crowd will make myself even more unpopular, that had we known, I would have said that's not appropriate. Let me give you an example for something that people here with my degree. When I was at the endowment, and then I'll shut up, there were several examples, but I'll just pick one. Ezra Pound, okay? Ezra Pound was a, a, a modern poet of uh, some renown. He was also a crazy man. He was a fascist and he was an anti-Semite, okay? He wrote something called a yellow series of poems, all right? Which would have been totally inappropriate for the endowment. To fund. On the other hand, his other poetry, like Maplethorpe's other photographs, are totally appropriate for the endowment to fund. And, and, and we ultimately did fund, uh, though I might say, to show you how deep these things run, including many people on the council, I won't mention names, but every Jewish member of the council voted against funding any exhibit or demonstration of Ezra Pound poetry, even though it had nothing to do. And these were people 
largely, well, they were appointed by different presidents. But the, but the point I'm making is, is that in culture, when you get into some really deeply felt things, we didn't fund an Amos and Andy exhibit either. Okay, all right. So you 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 have to use judgment. Let, let me. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, since I did get fired for this, I think I probably ought to be able to. Uh, let me make two points. The first is that offense is our birthright uh, in the United States. If we are never offended, the First Amendment is not working. The second point is we live with constant disinformation. To give you an example, a recent Harper's Index, 12% of the Americans believe that Joan of Arc is Noah's wife. <laughs> um, If we don't have an opportunity to expose the American people to that which is going on in the arts world, then I think we are all missing a great opportunity. I'm not saying that you have to hang these over your mantle. I'm not saying that every member of con con Congress has to like them. I'm saying that it is part of our birthright that we ought to have a broad exposure. And if, in fact, we are in constant fear of what's going to sail and what isn't going to sail, then I think that this is a very difficult um, enterprise. No? I, I, well, I, I, I'm with you, John, on this. And uh, I, I, you, we both went through very difficult times at the agency. And I think if you start down that slope, I don't know where you went. Do you do no uh, Wagner operas? I don't know the answer. No. Um, who chooses? Who chooses wh when do you choose? It becomes a very dangerous slope. There is, I would suggest, Jane, that there isn't anything you do in life where you don't have to choose. And, and you can get criticized if you make too many wrong choices. We all make mistakes. But in the, the same thing applies uh, when you're on, on a government agency. And just to John's point real quick, uh, there is no question that the Maplethorpe XYZ series or the Karen Finley performance art, uh, all of those things are going to get funded somewhere. They're going to be able to, to, to be shown. No one would suggest, not even the most you know, conservative person, that there isn't a right to have those things go on. The, the question is, is whether taxpayers' dollars can be used for those purposes. Now, there is a First Amendment argument. The Supreme Court in the Finley case uh, sort of broke the baby into bed. Uh, the people really were going to love me for this one. It's a little <laughs> like Roe v. Wade. That's the, the, the O'Connor majority opinion is sort of straddling in the middle of Souter, who was very First Amendment on the one hand, and Scalia and, and Thomas, uh, who were, you know, if it's a subsidy program, there, there is no First Amendment right to money from the government on the other hand. Uh, the, 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 the majority opinion, uh, actually, from a le legal point of view, used some rather interesting sort of I interventions uh, uh, that ultimately came out saying that the, the, the legal provision that was in dispute, um, was that decency standards could be taken into account as a part of the grant making procedure, okay, um, were, were, were okay. Uh, however, that legal, and Jim Fitzpatrick and I have had this argument, my view is that. When you're with a political institution, we're a democracy, OK? There are lots of people out there in that democracy who have all kinds of different views. I think democracy is really important, OK? And, and so when you're in a democracy, you have to respect all those different people. And I'm not saying minor offense. And I'm not saying that uh, you know, one person might have an offense or that there's nothing dangerous. But there is a judgment call as to when you cry, fire in a crowded theater through a grant making process. Bill? I frame things a little bit differently. I do think that as chairman of the NEA, one is the keeper of a public trust. You're spending taxpayer dollars. You're a small part. The agency is a small part of the total mix of things that fund culture in the United States. We're not a dictatorial uh, agency determining what artists can or cannot do. So we have to understand that our role is inherently, from the beginning, a limited one. Second, it's, it's not that cutting edge, contemporary, innovative, new, experimental art is an issue for the agency. 
It's not even that safe art is an, agency, is, a, is an issue for an agency. It's that from time to time, certain issues of content have come up. In the 1930s, the political content of literary works loom much larger than the sexual content of visual art. I think it's a shifting panorama that we deal with. But I think you, one does, an agency does, a chairman does, have to always remember that while the NEA can fund much, can be very experimental and cutting edge, there will be times when there are things that come along that you can't fund. To me, the problem is not those choices and not those problems. I think those challenges are challenges that make the work useful. That's why the people are there to make some of these judgments, to try to maintain the public trust. The challenge is how do we keep these individual issues from so easily converting into a conversation about eliminating the entire federal role. There are problems in the Department of Transportation. There are problems in the Department of Defense. But they don't convert into throwing out the baby, the bathwater, the sink, the bathroom, and the house. And, 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 and that's what's happened to the NEA. And I think that if we can move to the point where we address issues as issues and not as symptoms of a demonized federal presence, then I think we can build the investment very successfully. We want to go to questions from the audience, but Jane, you want to? Yeah, I, we haven't talked about the, the people who appropriate the funds. We need better minds in government. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that brings us to the Kennedy School. <laughs> um, All we need is well, a majority. Of Aren't they being trained we'll here? Be I mean, just the majority. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, there are microphones. Um, if you could go to the microphones, there's some upstairs too, I'm told. Um, yes. Uh, early in its life, the, uh, the arts endowment could be in some ways characterized as artist uh, centric. It was an institution whose grants quite often underscored the extraordinary cultural treasures we have in America. There has been from some of those who have observed the process over a period of years, a sort of metamorphosis, a focus more on what the arts contribute to society, still concentrating to the great credit of the endowment in the quality work that's happening throughout the nation, but very much an emphasis on what the arts are contributing to community, to community life, to a more socially oriented kind of, of focus. And I was wondering what the observations of the various chairmen might be about both the value and the lack of value in that kind of a development. Well, I'll tell you where we are now. You know, about 40% about of the agency's grant, direct grant making goes to the creation and, present, and presentation of work. So that remains a core part of what the endowment is all about. But I do believe the agency is a participant in, and I don't by any means think we're the cause of a, a, a sea change in the way artists and arts organizations connect with audiences and with communities. Uh, if you have the St. Louis Symphony operating the School of Music for the, uh, for, the, for the entire community, that's a choice on the part of that orchestra and its players to take on an, a, a major role in, in, in the community. And I think that would have been uh, unthought of uh, 25 or 30 years ago, and it's not something that was motivated by the NEA saying, make this change, make this kind of investment. So I, I think we're seeing artists and arts organizations in a healthy way leaning more toward an engagement with community and looking harder to find the language and the concepts to establish the value of their work so that there's a lasting sense of the need for this kind of presence in community and family life. Obviously, if you start to shrink your investment in art and art making to the point where it's all about community work, I think you may need to look back and see how you're doing. But, uh, but at the moment, I think this is, a, this is a, it's a sea change in the world of art and art making. We're a part of it. And of course, the agency also doesn't get a chance to give the direct grants to individual artists that it did 20 years ago by act of Congress. That's another conversation. But, but, just on sure. the community side, uh, the state arts agencies and local arts agencies, the endowment currently has 100 million, I mean, even if it had 300 million or, or a sub-larger number, this, this point would still be true. 
There's a billion dollars in public support out there. Most of it is local arts agencies, four, 400 or so. I, I won't have these numbers exact, but that roughly order of magnitude are states. At the, at the local and state level, community art is probably one of the most important things that they do and is very politically resonant with the elected officials. I live in a tiny community of 450 souls. I live outside of it, actually, in Ridgeway where the arts have brought together the chairman of our fundamentalist Christian church, of which I am also a member, okay, um, along with uh, uh, what I would call the sort of aging cult counterculture people in a variety of artistic uh, uh, efforts that include things like me playing in the bold soprano, if you can believe that, uh, 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 by, by an Inesco, to rock and roll, to Christian rock, to a whole variety of things. And you have all of these people okay, doing this stuff, and they are really proud of what they're doing. They took some of this to England. That's part that I'm not, and we're not unique. That's part of this community aspect of the arts. It's probably not right for the NEA, but it is sure right for public dollars at the state and local level. We have a question from John Bradamist, and I'm going to get to you upstairs. Um, yes. Frank, I want to make a comment more than a question, and I'll try to rattle them off quickly. In respect of the discussion about the problems of obscenity and all the rest, uh, I simply observed that just 10 years ago, my friend and colleague Leonard Garment, Leonard worked at the Nixon White House. I was on the Nixon White House enemies list. We co-chaired a 12-member 12, a 12 panel that produced a unanimous report, the Independent Commission, mandated by Sidney Yates uh, in the wake of the uh, fight over obscenity in, in 1989 which produced a unanimous report concer concerning the process by which the NEA makes its grants. And uh, I take the liberty respectfully of suggesting it would be useful to take another look at that report because uh, I, I think it helped, if I may say so, uh, protect the survival of the NEA. Point number two, you said at the outset, Frank, well, we're at Harvard. We certainly ought to be talking about the arts. Uh, President Rudenstein will forgive me if I say that 30 years ago I was a Harvard overseer and a member of the first committee, uh, overseer's committee to visit this school. And at that time, at least my memory tells me, of the 30 members of the board, there were only three of us who cared a damn about the arts. Amos Ames, the father of Lincoln Center, uh, Jay Islin, the president of Cooper Union, uh, and I. There simply wasn't much interest at this university in the arts. And because President Rudenstein has had the good judgment to marry an art historian, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that has helped a lot, and I rejoice that uh, the Kennedy School of Government is paying attention to the arts. Point number three, I've just come from a week in Mexico where I spoke uh, last week in Mexico City to a group of about 30 business representatives of organizations that want to know how can we support the arts. So there, there is greater interest in philanthropy, I think, in, in philanthropic support of the arts than we may think. And in today's financial times, there is a splendid section on business and the arts to which I call your attention. The last point I want to make is to touch on a, a matter that uh, my colleague Harriet Fulbright, who is the executive director of the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, and I have been working on, uh, has to do with the lack of attention and lack of support in our country for uh, sending culture, American culture abroad aside from motion pictures and television. Uh, Arts America was killed, was eliminated uh, a few years ago, and I would, uh, uh, Jim Billington, the Librarian of Congress, and I co-chaired at the Library of Congress a couple of weeks ago a meeting with about 30 top authorities on such on educational and cultural exchanges. And I, uh, I'm, I'm making too long a speech, and I was a congressman, not a senator, so you'll forgive me. Uh, but I would like to see I uh, would like to hear any judgment that these distinguished leaders have on how we can do a better job of sending the, the best in American art, popular art, uh, as well as high art abroad. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. <laughs> Jane? Uh, uh, first of all, John, thank you. And, and the Bradamus uh, Garment Commission was very valuable, and I did try to institute many of your suggestions, and I think I was successful at doing it was an extremely valuable bipartisan commission, and uh, I, I thank you both. Now, 
Thank you both for, <laughs> for uh, chairing it and, and for your suggestions. With regard to cultural exchange, I, I find it shameful that we don't have uh, more programs going abroad. There's virtually nothing except uh, I know that Penny Ojeda is here with the international program at the endowment now. I don't know exactly what the budget is, but uh, it's minuscule. Tiny. I think that we need uh, a, a, you asked for suggestions, I think we need uh, top level senators and congressmen to, to sit down with you, Bill, and uh, Madeleine Albright and really talk about what cultural exchange will do in terms of diplomacy and... It needs to be grounded in a We did, uh, in my time, <laughs> find... Uh, support for the idea that the National Endowment for the Arts, with all its goals and purposes, could serve as a wonderful catalyst with the private community in engendering new monies for the arts. But I also wanted to see this catalyst work in a wider way with other government agencies. And we had a program with the State Department then uh, to bring uh, cultural exchange and the arts, the best in the arts in this country and from abroad, to Belgium, to China, to uh, Japan, to Mexico. And these were very successful programs. This little badge here that I have is from Belgium. And the idea was to take a small country and do a uh, arts program with the small country so that they could expand their horizons and we could expand our knowledge of their work. And we started with a modest sum from the National Endowment, $250,000. And when that was announced, the Belgian government said, we will, we will match that sum. Then I found some American firms that were working in Belgium, and I said, we have a million dollars, how about matching that? So we had two million dollars, and by the time it was all through, we had five million dollars, and I think that that can be done again. I think it can be successfully accomplished uh, so that the and Frank worked on this in uh, Latin America, did you not? Uh, but I think it's a wonderful need that can be fulfilled by good thinking. There's a, uh, take a question from up there. Hi, I believe I'm uh, speaking as a representative for students from the Graduate School of Education in the Arts and Education program there. Um, when asking if you could talk a little bit about the future of the NEA, NEA's involvement in arts education, and specifically in uh, arts being a central part of the curriculum and equity in arts education. Uh, it, it's, it's very important. Right now, uh, about $7 million of the endowment's grant making addresses uh, arts education. We're fortunate in that in the, uh, we're now exploring, we're working in a partnership with the Department of Education with a small budget line item that is in their budget to work cooperatively with us developing arts education programming. And in the president's budget request this year, which is at $150 million level for the arts endowment itself, there's a request for an additional it's 11 or 12 million dollars in the Department of Ed budget to work with the, uh, with the NEA. That said, if we took all of our money and all of the money we would hope to have in our budget in the next decade, it would not be enough money to address by paying for it the needs of arts education in, in, in the country. So we have to work in partnership with other entities we have to work to develop model programming that will, can be extracted from our grant making and applied by others with other dollars. And you know, arts, education is very local. 
in the in this in this country. And so there is only so much that can be done at the federal level. But there's great progress that's been made. I think we've got something like in excess of 20 states. Jonathan Katz is here from NASA. He would know. But it's in excess of 20 states that have signed on to uh, uh, national arts standards, and that pendulum that had swung very far, I think, in the early mid-1970s, early 1980s, toward taking art out of the school for a variety of reasons, seems to be swinging back in the other direction. And I think our task now is to push on that pendulum as hard as we can to keep it moving in the right way. But we fund uh, curriculum-based uh, training. We fund after-school programming, a variety of sorts. And we fund uh, arts organizations to engage in educational activities, a wide range of, of programs. But we're not in a position in any part of, that, of this issue to, to pay the bill ourselves. We have to give the best examples and use our, we, the Arts Endowment has the advantage of possessing a great network of arts organizations that we can work with and a great network of state local arts agencies. So we have the mechanism out there to deliver services. We also are the agency that get out, gets up and thinks about art and art making every day. So I think we're the right agency to take the lead even though our dollars can't pay the bill. Could I just say one thing, Frank, about uh, arts education? Oh, sure, but make it, make it fast because we want to get as many questions as we can. I just want to tell the audience here about a wonderful experience that my wife and I had in a small community in, this, in the most deprived section of Houston in Texas. And if A.B. Spellman is here, he will remember this, uh, your, dep your deputy because he recommended that I go and visit this place. And it was an old movie house that was turned into a, a center for people to learn about the arts in this very deprived Hispanic community in a very deprived area. And driving to this place was like going through a desert and suddenly finding an oasis. And here were people actually working with their hands to rebuild this center. And the young fellow who was the director of it, and this is why I bring it up, said to me, you know, we thought the, pro uh, the problem here, the greatest problem, was one of drugs. But, he said, we realized we needed something special for the human spirit. And so we turned to the arts. And that phrase has stuck with me all through the years, something special for the human spirit. And we went to the local school, as, as you say, it's so much localized. And here were children with a sudden desire to learn because the arts were there, because of what their parents were doing in the old uh, movie house. And the whole place was alive with beautiful colors, vivid colors. And the teacher said the truancy rate here used to be 85 percent, and now it is less than 10 percent. And people are coming here, children are coming here, because they want to learn about the arts. And when they learn about the arts, they open their minds to other subjects like reading, writing, and arithmetic. So. The arts were a catalyst to bring education to this school. And I don't think, to, to speak to the questioner, I don't think there's anything more important than bringing education with an arts contribution to our country. Que Thanks. Just to put this in a little bit of, just to put this in a little bit of perspective, the Clinton administration has recently proposed a $291 billion military budget. And so I would hope we'd have leadership not just from the candidates who are out there, but also from the, from the current administration. I would hope we would find ourselves one day in the place where Star Wars would be just at least as controversial as a Maplethorpe photograph. Do you have a question? Um, um, yes, I do. OK, My would question, you ask it, please? That was, a, that was a, just a little intro. The question is, 
about the mechanisms for funding. And I wonder if anyone on the panel would agree with me that, that perhaps uh, rather than fight the battle, it wouldn't solve the problem of how the money is spent. But in terms of constantly having to have this be a battle for appropriations, that we might emulate some other places in the world where there is a small tax on the commercially viable culture that helps fund the arguably perhaps not automatically necessarily commercially viable culture, or perhaps we might even have a voucher system like we do in affordable housing. We could have site-based uh, vouchers, All right. or we could have people given vouchers, the people who need culture, let's say, and they could use those, those vouchers. <laughs> okay, to thank you. I, we get the drift. Does one person on the panel want to address the practicality of this? Well, we looked into all kinds of methods because when the 104th, 105th Congress wanted the NEA to be privatized, so I investigated all kinds of schemes from lottery to uh, tax checkoffs, et, et cetera to visiting Hollywood moguls saying, let's have a percentage. Would you please make foundations from your studios? I got zero uh, uh, progress in any of those areas. I did think, and many of people here in this room know about this, it started with you, John, that with the Copyright Extension Act, we might get a percentage of the 20-year window of extending the copyright from 50 to 70 years. Uh, that was passed, the Copyright Extension Act, this fall on a voice vote in the Senate under Mr. Trent Lott. So that was the end of that. We didn't get that either. Your idea is a good one, but um, it's going to be a very hard thing to try to, to do. We're going to have three more questions here, here, and here. Start with the gentleman over here. The, uh, Chairman Ivey on his borders crossing. Uh, introduction. Having said that, I'd like to point out that uh, this uh, show is very top-heavy, both uh, up front and in the audience, and put in a plug for Spare Change, the newspaper of the homeless people of the street. And the question is, they publish a centerfold spread of poetry, something that the New York Times would never dream of doing. And I wonder. Well, they dream. <laughs> <laughs> I continue to dream, Frank. I was a former journalist and I turned poet. Uh, uh, the question is um, uh, Does the NEA today and upcoming have the mentality, the apparatus, and the political will to put like money into something like spare change to pay people for the poetry page? Good question. Sure. I mean, I, I, I think the, I would say that the, the challenge there is more one of mechanism than will. Uh, literature is an interesting field for us because it's one of the areas in which we know that we have to actually cross that boundary between for profit and not for profit in nurturing small presses and uh, translation, things that might be structured as for-profit, but still really wouldn't exist without some outside support. I think the challenge, the grants are, it's competitive. Uh, it's looked at, the applications are looked at by panels of artists and experts and citizens. And so we would have to assume that there's a project related to that center page and that the quality of work is such that a panel would find it worthy of, of support. Those things being present, I think those, that, kind of, uh, that, that kind of work can be supported by the endowment. I think we can find a, a, a way. I think the challenge there is to, is to be aware. It, it, it has been supported, yeah. actually. The, the endowment has given grants to street theater and one that uh, I particularly liked, I think, was in Omaha called the Avant Garage Theater Company. So, so I, I think the, the answer is yes. Is that, is that the answer? Yes. I just want to uh, uh, pick up on something, actually, that Jane uh, spoke about in, in different ways, uh, which is the caliber of people who are voting on, on this uh, 
uh, on this issue, and uh, unfortunately, uh, not quite the caliber of the person I have the privilege to work with, which is uh, John Bradamus. Um, and um, it, it's not just a matter of ignorance, it's a matter of emphasis on, on, on um, uh, commercialism. And it, it seems to me that this is pervasive in our society. Broader than that, you, I'm sure, are aware of all the comments that we hear in the news business, the great lions of the news business who were so proud of it as an excellent um, organ of, of, of analysis and careful fact-checking, they're not so proud of it anymore because it's almost turned more and more towards entertainment. Um, and so uh, I'm wondering how the, uh, how the arts community, certainly with the help of um, uh, the, uh, and the leadership of the, of the NEA can, can counterbalance this um, massive emphasis on if it doesn't make money, then it's not worthwhile, and how we also educate. I mean, we've also dismantled an amazing uh, arts education and are having a great deal of trouble rebuilding it, even though what we know now is much more than we knew before, and we could put on the most extraordinary arts education in schools now, and it is frustrating to see that. Uh, you combining with, the, for instance, the Department of Education, how are we dealing with these kinds of things? It's a huge, uh, I, I, I was alluding to that problem when I talked about the change, say, at Columbia Records from the time that Goddard Lieberson ran it until, until today. Uh, I, I do think it's important to find a mechanism for engaging the cu engaging cultural business on a public policy basis. It's not something that the endowment can do. We're a tiny federal agency, but I do think an administration, a congressional commission could positively, I don't think there's any reason to point fingers and call names, but I think there are ways to positively engage that sector to address the problems that come with size, with the, uh, uh, with the, 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 the total uh, power, overwhelming power of the, of the marketplace uh, and, and, and begin to address some of these issues because we have lost, I think, quality in our for-profit cultural sector. And the, and the, and the for-profit cultural sector is capable of great work, great film, great television, great recordings. I think that sector is pressured by the need to produce profits on a quarterly basis and, uh, and, and the management does not have the flexibility to make the long-term judgments, to make the cultural investments that they know themselves in their hearts and in their minds are very, very important. Uh, I think that it is the case, you know, I think if you're the chairman, I think all of us have had the occasion to see that being chairman of the NEA makes you in a sense a public intellectual and it gives you an opportunity for a time to talk about issues and try to address things in an important way. To the extent that that makes a difference, I think it's something that I can take on, and I think others, I mean, Frank has worked in this, in this issue, and Jane has addressed some of these challenges. It's, if I may venture just one opinion before we go to the last question, this, I would just also say that whatever role the NEA can play, the NEA is one small federal agency, and the problem you describe is such an enormous issue. I mean, institutions such as Harvard University or the New York Times, it's, it, all every sort of big institution that's still not entirely part of this sort of entertainment maw has to has to address it. And uh, what Bill described happening to say the, the CBS records built by Goddard Lieberson is exactly comparable to what happened to the news division that was built by. Edward R. Murrow and Charles Collingwood and so on. So it's happening across the board, yeah. and, and the NEA obviously can play a, 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 a positive role, but even if it were five times its size, it'd still be a David against a pretty considerable Goliath. Last question. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I believe the last question addressed part of it, but I, have a, I think I could tailor my question a little more specifically. I had the luxury of being an undergraduate at Harvard and uh, the luxury of also being a graduate student at Yale. One taught me a lot about life, the other taught me a lot about work, and I won't tell you which was which. 
Um, <laughs> what I learned at Yale was that one of the uh, uh, things one had to do when defining, when charting one, one's course in business was to identify the competition. Um, and I think that we're at a point, I believe we're at a point um, in the arts where we have to take a much better stock of who the competition is for the leisure time, the leisure dollar, um, all of those things that we have grown up with as being sort of the purview of the arts. I refer specifically as a parent now to two issues that I'm um, surprised have not been more critically addressed tonight. The first, of course, is television specifically. Um, many of my undergraduate friends at Harvard are responsible for, I believe, most of the decay of <laughs> television over the past 20 years. Um, and I salute them for that. They're far wealthier than I will ever be. Um, but the, the, the next big Pandora's box um, on the uh, cultural horizon is the internet. And I have seen the isolation that occurs on individu in individual homes as people stare into the television set and now they're staring into their uh, computer sets. And I'm wondering if you can help give us guidance as arts professionals, which I am, uh, as to how I can help frame the public debate away from this very competitive enterprise, which I feel has been one of the most difficult parts of our culture to overcome in order to get creativity back in our schools and in our lives. Who would like to take that on? Frank? I'd like to at least address the, the new technologies and the internet. Um, and, 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 and throw out some things which we'll, may, may get uh, some further conversation after this is over going. Um, my own view is the record industry is dead. Uh, we will see all of music streamed through the internet in a fairly short period within the next 10 years. Uh, what that will mean on the opportunity side is that almost anybody can get on. On the problem side, because the trunk lines will be controlled by a few people, we need to make sure that those pipes are open. So that's a, that's a policy issue for the Federal Communications Commission and, and, and folks like that. In the case of moving images, okay, uh, actually, you know, Hollywood deserves to be bashed, but not entirely. Um, uh, almost every major studio, and I'm going to come to television last, almost every major studio now has what it calls its art circuit house. Okay, Lindsay Law does the, does the, the Fox one, and there's the equivalent at, at, at the others. And they produce some rather interesting films, including one that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, that's pure commercial, but it's done to niche audiences. As streaming comes on, line as it will eventually. Uh, uh, there's still some issues with it. Uh, for, for video, I think you will see both, you know, more opportunity uh, on that as well as for however mass audiences, uh, they're likely to gravitate to some AOL combination with Time Warner, etc. But again, keeping the pipes open as a technical matter will be absolutely critical. Let me go to visual arts and I'll bring this to a close, um, uh, or literature for that matter. Um, there are already vehicles, uh, both in the not-for-profit and in the for-profit sectors, to allow artists to showcase through the internet, uh, and you know you can get to the gallery whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit. And I think that is likely to open up uh, uh, addition and additional avenues. So to, to bring this part of to, to a close, I think there are opportunities and problems, and one is going to have to be very careful about the regulatory mechanism to make sure that the opportunities outweigh the problems. Let me just add one thing to that. Uh, there is, for example, a website called nextmonet.com, which is a commercial, I think they're commercial, um, uh, sales opportunity for artists on the web, which is really quite good. I, I invite you to, uh, you know, I don't have any stock in this or anything, but I, <laughs> I invite you to look at their website because I think it's a pretty good model of how uh, art can be sold on the web. I think what we may get, however, is a, a sort of uh, a backlash to the isolation of the net that will encourage people to want to seek other humans' company in, in like kinds of, event, of events. And we've seen this before in the arts. You know, photography is going to ruin the visual arts. Well, it didn't. Uh, movies are going to ruin legitimate theater. It didn't. Uh, and I think we're going to get a bounce back from that. So I, I, I would not go with the doom and gloom scenario. I, I would say, I would, I would add that uh, cultural organizations 
in this environment are great keepers of uh, the real in an, in an age that's tilting toward the virtual. I think it's a very powerful asset that uh, cultural organizations have either in the form of collections or the human assets of the performing and presenting skills that they bring. I think it's going to be very, very important that cultural organizations protect those assets as things are streamed into a, an internet environment. Uh, it's, it, it, it is a time in which organizations should only, only rent their capabilities, never sell them, because I think we're going to see uh, those entities that can provide and control content and cultural organizations, both for-profit and not-for-profit, are those entities. I think if the assets are protected properly, there are some wonderful opportunities uh, in, in, this, in this new technology. I think that's a, a very good note to end on, actually, uh, the, f the, the real the future that's streaming towards us so fast. I want to thank uh, the Kennedy School for putting on what is really an unprecedented show to have these chairs of the NEA together. It's never happened before, I don't think, and may never happen again, even though it, <laughs> no one hit each other. Um, Th uh, so th thank you for coming, and please join me in thanking all these people who have served <laughs> our country. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah.